you know, eating food on Shabbos is a somewhat central day. It's a somewhat central part of Shabbos. I don't know if you've ever yeah, spent a Shabbos, but there seems to be an awful lot of the stuff, that's for sure. Um, however, there are all kinds of issues with regard to warming up food on Shabbat, what you can eat, what you can't eat, how you can warm up things, how you can't warm up things. So let's have a quick look and see, see what can be done over there. So first of all, Friday night is a lot less complicated. Um, all the food needs to be really cooked before Shabbos, and then it can be put onto either a hot plate, or it can be put onto what's called a glech, which is a copper plate that's placed on top of a gas flame um, that's normally kept pretty low and kept on uh, over Shabbos. Uh, or if you've got a timer on your oven, electric oven, you can put it into the oven, and when the timer goes off, you can take the food out. There is a problem with opening up an electric oven that's working on Shabbos. Even when you've got a thermostat, a thermostat set on a particular temperature, there is a problem because the way that these things work is very simple. The, uh, as you open the door, it introduces cold air. The cold air causes the, the thermostat to kick in in order to keep the, the temperature at a constant temperature. <clears throat> and that means that by opening up the door, what you've done is you've caused the oven to work on Shabbos, which is not something you're supposed to be doing. Uh, subsequently, there are over here in Israel, and I think there are some ovens now in America that have a Shabbos, some kind of a Shabbos uh, switch on them. And that keeps the oven on a constant temperature the whole time, regardless of what's going on with the door. Now that is okay to use. There's no problem with that. And there's no problem with opening, opening the door to take food out when you've got something like that. However, under normal circumstances, <clears throat> you've you got to be very careful. You've got to check out these things. If you're buying an appliance, you've got to check them out. If you've got a board appliance already, the chances are that it does not have a Shabbos mode in it. And if that's the case, then you can't open it up whilst it's working. Again, all ovens nowadays come with timers. It's not that complicated to work out, you know, to have it go off. Let's say, for example, you want the, you're going to come home from shul and you want it to, you want it 6.30, you want to be able to start eating. You can have your oven go off at 6.30. Once it goes off, you can open up the oven without any problems whatsoever because nothing is going to happen. There's nothing, there's no problem with opening and closing the oven on Shabbos if it's not working. Um, <clears throat> so on Friday night, the food can be placed directly on top of whatever heating system you've got, whether you've got an electric hot plate or whether you've got a uh, this black, this copper thing that sits on top of the flame, or whether it's going into the oven. Any of those systems is absolutely okay. Um, you don't have to be concerned whether things are liquid, whether they're solids, which means that you can put before showers, you can put your soup on the hot plate, you can put your chicken on the hot plate. Um, you know, I mean, personally, I recommend killing it first, but that's mm -hmm. just, you know, <clears throat> my, my personal, <laughs> personal preference, for sure, for sure. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, whatever else it is, every, everything is fine. However, Shabbos day is more complicated <clears throat> because you're not allowed to directly heat things up on Shabbos day. <clears throat> and if you're Ashkenazi, we've got an additional problem over here of the difference between liquid and solids which means, <clears throat> as an Ashkenazi, it's forbidden to take liquid, something liquid, and heat it up on Shabbos day. So, for example, you know, if you've got chicken in gravy and you want to heat it up during the day, it's a problem because the gravy is normally, even if it's still liquid or if it's, if it's uh, jellified a little bit, it doesn't matter, it's forbidden to heat it up on Shabbos. What you can do is you can heat up certain foods that are solids on Shabbos, so long as they're not put directly onto the hot plate. What's an example of them? Here, so for example, if you've got, you know, schnitzel or chicken that's not in gravy or all kinds of kugels, so for example, potato kugel or noodle kugel or, uh, and help me out, Yerushalmi kugel, help me out, people, help me out. Oh, so, uh, so like, okay. like... Carrot apple, kugel, apple kugel. Apple, apple kugel. Apple. Right, good. So a lot yeah. of people Sweet call potato kugel, okay. I think we zucchini kugel. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's interesting. Yesterday, just when we spoke just about just different speaking. kinds of halachas that had nothing to do with food, there was yes. absolutely no interaction whatsoever. <laughs> and now, mention the word kugel, and all of a sudden, you've got you know people are just they can't they can't be stopped over here. It's incredible. So wait, absolutely incredible. Ooh. Yes. Shouldn't. 
We'll get to Cholent in a minute. No, because that's specific. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get there in a minute. Hold on a second. Uh, <clears throat> what do you have to do? You have to take the, any, any kind of solid foods, and when you want to put them onto the hot plate, you need to put them onto something that shouldn't go directly onto the hot plate. There's a problem with warming things up directly. So the best way to do this, I find, is to have my wife do it. But, but um, if you don't have one of those at your disposal, then the best way to do it is to take a disposable aluminium or aluminium dish and just turn it upside down, put that onto the hot plate, and then place whatever you want to warm up on top of that. The other condition is that it shouldn't be covered, right? So it can be covered partially, but it shouldn't be completely covered. And uh, then you can warm it up. There's no problem with warming up, war warming that up. You can have warm schnitzels and you can have warm kugel um, and uh, all other kinds of things. Again, if there, sorry, if, if there's a liquid involved, then you should not be warming it up. Yes. You might not cover it. Not, it shouldn't be covered on all four sides. You, sh you shouldn't have it covered and then and wrapped up on the sides. It needs to be open somewhere. That there shouldn't be. It shouldn't be covered completely. Okay, so if you want to warm it up and it's going to warm up better if it's got a cover on it, then take a piece of silver foil and just, just put it on the other way, in the other direction, so the sides are left uncovered. That's okay, just it shouldn't be covered completely. Now, yes? So, the, the emphasis I couldn't work out if that was going to be a question or if you changed your mind and decided to push your glasses up. I got terrified. <laughs> or maybe you were aiming for your nose and you missed, I don't know, but... Uh, um, the putting the putting the food directly on the system, uh, regardless of liquid or solid, that's like pre Shabbat. That's pre Shabbat, right? And pre Shabbat, it doesn't make any difference whether it's liquid or whether it's solid. You can put it on without any problems whatsoever. On Shabbat, it shouldn't go directly onto the heating element, and uh, and it should not be liquid. Yeah. So why is it okay to put ice and water on Shabbos? Why is it okay to put ice and water on Shabbos? Yeah. Because otherwise you won't have cold drinks. Yeah, but I'm, but it's like you, it's a it's a solid becoming a liquid. Yeah, I, ice is absolutely it's, it's ice is pretty fascinating halachically. It's pretty fascinating scientifically as well. Actually, I don't know if you know anything about ice, but ice is uh, you know the fact that it floats is really quite extraordinary. Um, Hakadosh Baruch Hu was kind to us so that we could have ice floating in our drinks instead of bobbing around at the bottom. Um, what, what it, why is it okay to make? What, why is it okay to put ice in your water or in your cold, in your drink to make it cold on Shabbos? You're allowed to do it so long as you are not taking out the ice in order to melt it. Which means the melting is just a side, a side issue of what you need the ice for. If you're taking out ice in order to have cold water, right? You're not going to add water to it. You're just going to take out a. A, a glass of ice and leave it there until it melts in order to be able to have a nice glass of cold water. That's a problem on Shabbos because that's deliberately changing its status from one thing to another. Um, it's interesting, for example, you, you are, you're not allowed to make ice on Shabbos yeah. because you're changing something from water into ice. That's something which is forbidden. It's forbidden to change one thing from, from, one, from one thing into another thing on Shabbos, um, and ice, what, what's interesting, for example, you know they have these things over here, they're called igloos. I don't know if you know what they are, but they're little, they're little uh, plastic, uh, sort of little tubes filled with, uh, filled with colored water, and uh, you know, you put them in the, you put them in the freezer and they, uh, they're ice, I don't know, what, what are they called, popsicles maybe, what are they yeah, called in America? Ice icy pops, oh. whatever, icy oh. pops. Oh. Huh? We call them otter pops. You live in an igloo, you live in one of those. I mean, sometimes I think that my grandchildren live inside of these things because they're forever in there. But, but uh, uh, over here in, in Israel, they're called igloos. Don't ask me why. <clears throat> Maybe they call what the house that the Eskimos live in over here icy pops. I don't. I don't. I really don't know. Um, this is this is Israel. You know, don't don't ask questions about things like that. Um, but the the. Uh, the, uh, you're allowed to take an icy pop and freeze it on Shabbos because it hasn't changed its form. It, it, it was a defrosted icy pop and now it's a frozen icy pop as opposed to water where you're taking water and you're turning it into ice. It's got two, two different categories. So wait, so wait, I think I, I didn't quite hear you before. So why is it that you can take frozen ice in a solid state and put it in water which 
it becomes liquid state. How is that permitted? Because <clears throat> again, it's it's you're not you're not doing this because you want it to melt. You're doing it because you want the cold, but, right? But if you have the intention. Oh, so again, if your intention is to melt the ice, then that's a problem on Shabbos. Which means, if you're, like yeah. I said before, if your intention is to get yourself a real ice cold glass of water by just putting it in the glass and letting the ice melt to be able to drink it, that would be forbidden to do on Shabbos, okay. right? But if you're going to add water into the mixture, then that would be okay. Why do we philosophically categorize ice and water as separate? And they're the same? <clears throat> it's interesting because, because uh, ice, ice, and wa ice and water, it's got a lot to do with what they're called. Right? A, a lot of these halachic classifications come down to what the, how, how you're defining the thing to begin with, right? So let's go back to the icy pop or the igloo, right? An and icy pop, what, what did you call them? Otter pop. Otter pop. Auto pop. Really? No. What? I heard you guys. Well, okay. Well, we're going to use, we're going to use words that everyone is familiar with. So let's say you, you take your pop, right? <clears throat> that, not your father, and uh, and you you uh, the 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 so icy pop. No, stop it. The icy pop <laughs> is an icy pop, whether it's frozen or not, right? The only difference between you put them in the freezer, it becomes, it becomes a frozen icy pop, but it was an icy pop to begin with. Whereas water and ice are regarded as two separate entities, and that's what they're called, right? One is called water, and one is called ice. <clears throat> what water turns into ice. You don't, nobody talks about having frozen water or melted ice, right? You've got water or you've got ice. And that's one of the things that's going to make the difference between whether something, you know, what, what the halachic cl classification is going to be. Yeah. Let's say I have Friday night dinner and there's less of a chicken soup. Yes. Can I leave it on the hot plate? <clears throat> okay, let's talk about that. Before we, before we talk about cholent, let's talk about leftover chicken soup or any other kind of soup. Um, you can leave soup on the cholent. Uh, yes, I will try that one again. <clears throat> you can leave soup on your hot plate. That's okay, so long as it wasn't taken off beforehand. Which means like this. Most people, when they come to serve the soup, they'll take it off of the hot plate and then they'll serve it from the kitchen counter or they'll pour it into something else and they'll serve it through that. Once you've done that, you can't put it back onto the hot plate. If you, uh, if you leave the soup on the hot plate, then anything that's left over can stay there and you can have it on Shabbos morning as well. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it sits there stewing for another few hours and it becomes even tastier than it was. I have a brother who, uh, that's what they actually make, my, my sister-in-law makes two pots of soups and one pot of soup is used on Friday night, and the other one is left on the, uh, on the uh, hot plate, and they use that on Shabbos morning. That is okay. There's no problem with that whatsoever. Right? Uh, let's talk about cholent. <clears throat> cholent is something which defies description. Uh, it is a, an amalgamated mass of whatever might be lying around on the kitchen counter on Erev Shabbos that is thrown into a pot, and uh, then, you know, depending on where you come from, various other bits and pieces are added. If you're American, you'll probably squirt some ketchup in there and add some honey and some sugar and uh, maybe some molasses and uh, maybe some syrup. And, uh, you know, and then if it's still not sweet enough, then add some uh, artificial sweetener of some kind. Um, and it's left, it's normally left, just left to cook. Now, there, there are basically two different, two different ways of making cholent. Uh, one way of making cholent is to cook it all so that it's, it's cooked before Shabbos and then put it onto the hot plate. The other way of making cholent is just to put it on before Shabbos whilst it's still uncooked and let it cook its way through Friday night. Both of those are acceptable. What do you got to be careful? First of all, where does cholent come from? So uh, according to Rashi, there's a possibility that the word cholent comes from two French words of show, which means hot, and lay, which means long. And it's hot and long. It's just like lying over there stewing away. Um, one, of, one of the reasons that's given why we eat cholent, the, the custom of eating cholent, is to make sure that no one should imagine that we're Karaites. The Karaites only kept the written Torah. They didn't pay any attention to the oral Torah. 
In the written Torah, it says you're not allowed to kindle any lights on Shabbos, which means that they didn't have any light in their homes, they didn't have any fire in their homes, they didn't eat any hot food either. In order to show that we are not Karaites, <coughs> we eat Cholent. Now, again, Cholent, it's got liquid in it, it's got all kinds of bits and pieces inside of it. Um, <coughs> Cholent itself is absolutely fine to eat. Once it's been taken off the hot plate, it shouldn't be put back onto the hot plate again. Uh, and it sits there over Shabbos, it sits there over Friday night, and on Shabbos morning, it's normally served up. Um, again, depending on where you, you know, depending on where you eat, depends on what you're going to find inside of it. Amongst the, uh, amongst the Sfadim, they eat something called chamin. The word cham means hot. Chamin, it's normally, you know, because it's Middle Eastern, it's got a slightly different flavor to it. It normally has chickpeas inside of it. Sometimes you'll find eggs inside of it. Uh, just beware, very often the eggs have their shell on them. I found that out when I got invited to my Chavrus's house once. I didn't know, and his wife was Moroccan, and he made, you know, there was Cholent, Shabbos morning, there was Cholent, and I see an egg, and I'm very partial to eggs, and uh, so I stepped my spoon in it, and I spent the rest of the, of the meal trying to sort of work my way around the bits of shell that were scattered all <laughs> over my Cholent, because no one had warned me that the thing still had a shell on it. Um, on the rare occasions where... When my wife puts eggs in the cholent, she normally boils them first and then she peels them and puts them in so that they're kind of ready, ready to go straight away. I think that the custom of putting eggs inside of the cholent comes from the ability to make it just that little bit more unhealthy than it might have been otherwise. Um, it's pretty unhealthy stuff. My mother always used to say that the idea of God, you know, resurrecting the dead is nothing compared to us waking up on Shabbos afternoon after two bowls of cholent in order to go and dab mincha. She said, if God can get us up on Shabbos afternoon, then for sure he can get the dead up. That's a lot easier. There's no, no doubt at all. Uh, cholent, it's, it's wonderful stuff. Um, you know, you can, you can eat it and uh, you can enjoy it. And there's a hand up there. Yes. So some, some people have told me that uh, you have to be careful when it comes to Turkish coffee on Shabbos because it's like cooking it, but it's it's like it's roasted coffee, so it's like something that already cooked. Okay, so let, let's have a let's have a look at uh, just just before we get to coffee and tea, let's hold on just one minute. Um, the the uh, so Chol that's where Cholent is coming from, right? Cholent is it's absolutely fine to eat Cholent. Um, you got to be careful with certain things. You know, it's it's permissible to take frozen food out of the out of the freezer and eat it on Shabbos. You can even warm it up a little bit if you leave it next to the hot plate. You're not supposed to put it directly onto the hot plate. But for example, plenty of people, you know, I don't know, you, you need a challah or something. You, you ate more challah than you thought you were going to eat on Friday night. Now you need a challah. Shabbos morning, you can take it out from the freezer. You can eat it. The one thing you have to be careful about when using the freezer on Shabbos, actually there are two things you need to be careful about. Uh, the first one is not to leave it open for too long. Uh, that goes without saying, which is why I'm saying it, because most things that go without saying need to be said right? More, quite, quite often, actually. Uh, there's a problem with leaving the freezer open too long because you're introducing hot air into it. It will set off the motor pretty quickly, so you've got to be careful. The other problem with using the freezer on Shabbos is that certain things inside of your freezer are going to be mukta. They're going to be forbidden to touch on Shabbos. For example, raw chicken, raw meat. Things that are not eaten unless they've been cooked have no use on Shabbos whatsoever, and it's a problem to touch them. Which means if your challah is underneath a, I don't know, a, you know, a, 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 a raw chicken that's been frozen in there, it's a problem to get it out of there. I don't know how you're going to do it. That's considered very mukta. Mukta. Chicken, raw chicken. Yeah, raw, raw chicken is considered to be mukta. Raw fish might be less of a problem because, uh, you know, with the advent of sushi, uh, yeah. people for some reason like to eat their fish still raw. Gosh, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, see that, that look of longing and desire, it's really quite. Uh, yeah. What's that thing that people use to cook their chillin in? I can't remember the name of it. Oh, that. there's something called a crock pot. Yeah. Uh, because it's used by, used by old crocks. No, no, that's not the reason. Uh, there's a crock pot which is a slow, a slow cooker. Um, you know, a lot of people, it's a, a, a very, very much an American thing. You just pour all the ingredients into your slow cooker. You put it on before Shabbos and it just cooks away. 
Um, there was an interesting about, I don't know, almost 20 years ago, there was an interesting uh, fullness of halachic, halachic debate that took place about whether there is a problem of something called hatmona, which is the sealing of something on Shabbos, whether there was a problem with using a hot plate. Some authorities over here suggested, you know, most, not a hot plate, I'm sorry, a crock pot, a, a slow cooker. Uh, most, some authorities over here ruled that uh, most slow cookers today come with an insert, which means you can pull the whole thing out like a ceramic insert. Uh, and they suggested that to avoid any problems, it would be better to put something underneath that it shouldn't sit directly inside, sit snugly, but a little bit of it should be sticking out over the top. That way you get around the problem of Hatmona. In America, the, uh, the uh, authorities, the halachic authorities in America felt that it wasn't a problem, which is why you'll see in many, many, many American homes, uh, crock pots are being used, hot, you know, uh, slow cookers are being used. And uh, whatever, you know, everyone should rely on whoever they rely upon. Yeah. I've seen in some, like, homes, uh, they put some kind of, like, bag or uh, some kind of barrier between, like, the chola and the actual um, pot. I don't, I don't think it's plastic, but it's, uh, it's clearly some kind of bag. Yeah, I think, I think that that's, that's only in order to keep the thing clean. Oh, really? Yeah, I think okay. so. It's, it's, one of the, it's one of the, it looks like it's plastic, but it's obviously some kind of, some, mm -hmm. some kind of material that one would hope that nothing is going to happen to it. <laughs> and it's not sort of leaking all kinds of toxins into the cholent, although it's difficult to imagine how it could be worse for you than it already is. Sure. What happens if you get to Shabbat and you realize that you, have, you forgot to turn, everything's on a hot plate, you forgot to turn it on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> it's, uh, <laughs> this, might be, this might be a moment for you to... Uh, to sort of build up a relationship with your next door neighbor, <laughs> you know, rather quickly, I would say. Um, if, if the hot plate's not been put on, there's not very much that you can do about it. <clears throat> um, once it's not on, it's not on. You know, if, some, if it, for some magical reason it were to go on again, let's say, for example, you've got some kind of a, a, a power cut in your house, right? The power's gone out in your house and then it comes back on during Shabbos. So some of the things that are on your hot plate are going to be okay to eat and some of them aren't. Uh, you've got to be careful. The liquids are going to be a problem over there. Um, somebody might tell you, you know, go go and find somebody not Jewish and ask them to put the plug back in. It's a little bit of a problem asking non-Jews to do things on Shabbos which are forbidden for you to do uh, because there's a concept in the halacha called Amir al which is telling a non-Jew to do something under normal circumstances what's forbidden for you to do. It's forbidden to ask somebody else to do as well. If there's a din over here of pikuach nefesh, so let's say, for example, <clears throat> you know, you have to, some, there's somebody elderly in the house, or there is a, a kid who needs a, uh, so, a kid who needs some kind of a, you know, va sorry, a vaporizer. I couldn't remember what, I, know, I was going to say respirator, but that sounds a little bit, <laughs> I mean, if they need a respirator as well, right? But uh, a vaporizer, then it's possible to ask a non-Jew to come and put the fuse back up again in order to get the house back into working order. But under normal circumstances, well, all you can do is hint. If you hint to a non-Jew, and then you have to hope, right? So if you've got non-Jews here, so you go, yeah, the, the lights are not on in your, in your uh, dining room, right? And you bring in, you go next door and you ask the, the, you know, your next door neighbor to come in and you say, gosh, it's terribly dark in here. <clears throat> now, if the fellow will say, yes, you're right, isn't it? And walk out of there, <laughs> then you're stuffed. There's nothing you can do about it. You train your um, dog. Huh? You train your dog. You can train your dog so long as it's not Jewish. You know that fam you know the famous joke? But can you, you know that famous joke? Can you the fellow that? comes to the rabbi and he says, Rabbi, he says, I want to give my dog a bar mitzvah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> dog, what are you talking about? You, you idiot. You know, you think dogs don't have bar mitzvahs. They're not, what, 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 is, what, what do you think? So he says, Rabbi, he says, uh, I'm prepared to pay you. He says, really? He says, how much? So the fellow says, $5,000. He says, well, why didn't you say your dog was Jewish? <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to be, be careful, right? Make sure your dog is not Jewish uh, if you're going to train him to put, the, to put the lights on and off on Shabbos. Um, but uh, yeah, you know what? I mean... Uh, <laughs> can, you, can you tell a guy Monday or Tuesday, whenever, during the week, does any of my uh, things go off electrically during the night? Would you be able to, I'm not going to tell you to do it, but can you do it? I'm not going to tell you then. Yeah, yeah. 
You can prime. Edu yeah, 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 yeah. You'll you'll see. You know, it's in interesting that there are stories, fascinating stories. In, in the in the olden days, um, in the various little shtetlich, in in all the little villages all all over Eastern Europe. So there was somebody who was always called the Shabbos Goy. And he was a non-Jew, and his, his job was, you know, just to make sure everything, if, if something went wrong, so you went to him, and he knew what to do. Sometimes he knew the halachas better, better than the people did, right? And he would know how to, you know, he would know how, he would know how to sort things out. Just, just, by, just by, you know, again, you would go in and you'd say, it's terribly dark in my dining room, and he would know to come around immediately and put the lights on. Um, right? But uh, again, you've got to be careful that, you know, you, it, can't, it can't be too explicit what it is that you're saying. It can't be, gosh, it's terribly dark in here, and if you were to put the lights on, it would be a lot less dark. Um, can you say that, oh, is your electricity also Yeah, you could, that, that's good. You could go, yeah, if you've, let's say you've had a power cut, right? Yeah. So you could go next door and you could say, wow, you know, uh, is your power out like mine? And then hopefully the person's going to say, wow, and he's going to, you know, jump into a telephone box and turn himself into Superman and come rushing around to your house and put the fuse up. Or he might say, no, mine's doing fine, thank you. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> doing great. <laughs> they, are you allowed to heat stuff in their house? Are you allowed to heat stuff? I mean, if they happen to have a, a hot plate <laughs> plugged in in their home, which is re reasonably I unlikely, I would imagine, imagine. then uh, you could go next door and you could, uh, you could put some of your stuff over there in order to warm it up. If, if, the, if you've got a power cut, Let's say Shabbos comes in, everything is working fine, right? And all of a sudden the power goes out. It's possible to take your stuff and move it so long as it's still hot, right? You can move it onto somebody else's hot plate. That's okay, right? But that's already that's a, a somewhat, somewhat involved um, thing. <clears throat> yeah, somebody was waving a hand around. Yeah. Yes. Um, I have a question about like the Shabbos school and the, the hot plate and like showing Shabbat. Um, like, when I was younger, me and my brother would be, like, in the back seat. We'd be fighting, and my mom would be like, like, don't, just don't touch each other. And my brother would, like, come up to me, like, like this. Like, <laughs> pretty much touching me, and we would continue fighting. I wonder why your nose looked like that. Yeah, right? he, he wasn't touching me, but he was touching me. I feel like those things, like, when you go and you ask, like, a Shabbos goy to, like, do something, you're not touch you're not breaking Shabbat rules. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Really, Good. Okay. Really Here, it, it, I'll tell you what's fascinating about what you're saying. The, the, uh, you, you mentioned Shabbos clocks, right? A yeah. time, time switch. <clears throat> um, what, what do you call them in America? Time switch? What do you call them? Timer? Yeah, yeah time. whatever. Yeah, Something time. that puts the lights on and off and all that time, kind of stuff. <clears throat> um, Rav Moshe Feinstein was very much against them. He felt that, uh, that uh, it's something that shouldn't be used on Shabbos. It's interesting that it, across the board, Timers are absolutely accepted by every. I've never come across anybody that doesn't use one uh, in you know in our generation. Um, but nevertheless, he felt that also he felt that it was something that was uh, detracting a little bit from the spirit of what Shabbos was supposed to be. Um, you know, do you do you have to like? I, I don't know. The chat's like this. You, you don't have to go to the non-Jew and ask him to help you out. Um, obviously, sometimes it's more important than other times. That's for sure. So if you've got somebody who's not very well and you need the heating on in your in your uh, you know in your apartment or in your house, so then there's then there's not there's no question anymore about whether you should or whether you shouldn't go to somebody and ask them if they can help you out. But uh, under normal circumstances, again, if you if you don't feel comfortable doing it, then uh, you know good. I think that's that's you know I I'm I'm not going to say that you you know tavol lecha brocha you'll get a you'll get a blessing for being uh, you know for being more careful but I definitely think that you're certainly you're certainly you know staying within the realms of what the halacha was supposed to be that's for sure right um, let's talk about cooking things on Shabbos right you mentioned coffee yeah right um, there are certain things which Cook now. I don't know very much about Turkish coffee. I don't know how it's manufactured. I have, I have a little, I have a little, uh, you know, confession that I have to make to everybody over here. And I think, yeah, I think that we've known each other enough time for me to be able to tell you this without you thinking even less of me than you already do, which is difficult to imagine how you could think any less of me than you already do. But I don't drink hot drinks uh, at all, actually. Um, what? Why? 
never really thought about it. Just, <laughs> just don't do it. I don't, I don't like hot drinks. I'm not very keen on soup either. It's interesting. My 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 wife brought me here this morning, and completely out of the blue, she says to me, "Do you like my chicken soup?" <laughs> and I said, "You know, yeah, it's okay." And she says, "Okay." I said, "No, no, it's it's delicious, <laughs> delicious, and it really is. It really is delicious." But I'm not. I'm really not. I'm not very keen on soup either, actually. So iced coffee. Huh? Iced coffee. Okay. So. Uh, here we go. I, I really, I really do apologise for what I'm about to tell you now, and oh, how, however much you know, you may not think of me. Um, I think my estimation is about to plummet. But I don't like coffee at all. Oh, okay, guys, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> You're English. How about tea? I'm English. I don't, I don't drink tea either. I'm, I'm sorry. I really. Do you eat scones? Sometimes, when, the, when there's no other alternative. What? <laughs> I'm, I'm some I'm some kind of a hybrid I'm some kind of a hybrid alien um, I, I I really I really do apologize and I'm sorry I shouldn't have told you both of these things on the same day I can see that you're you're, you're struggling with it iced tea huh iced tea no iced tea uh, I mean I don't drink hot drinks I'll drink iced tea if there's nothing else to drink but you know um, that's that's very kind of you to call me that. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate what? <laughs> Here, we'll get, we'll, get, we'll get to it in a minute. And salad. There, there, are, there are. What? What about cutting up salad and vegetables and everything like that? That's okay. Oh, we'll, we'll get. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> drinks, drinks. Muggies coffee. Okay, lettuce juice. Is that what, that's, that's what you're interested in. Uh, how, how, do, do, you know, do you know how Turkish coffee is made? Uh, it's, it's like every other coffee that's not dehydrated coffee. Is that what you drink instead of tea? Yeah, coffee ground up. Yeah, that's all. That's all it is. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the thing is like this: that there are certain foods which cook very easily. Halachically, they cook very easily. Tea is one of them. Tea leaves don't require very much heat at all in order for them to cook, which is the problem of making tea on Shabbos. Right, um, which means like this: that the best thing to do with regards to making tea is to make tea essence before Shabbos. Take some tea bags, add hot water, let it uh, become very, very, very concentrated. Just let it sit there and stew for you know as long as you want, and then that can be used to that can be used diluted with hot water in order to give you a cup of tea on Shabbos. There's a problem with using tea bags on Shabbos, you're cooking the tea leaves inside of it. There's a problem with using fresh tea without a tea bag. When I was a kid growing up, they introduced something called tea essence, which were granules, a little bit like, a little bit like, a little bit like coffee, but they were made out of tea. And uh, I have to tell you that halachically, it was absolutely fine to use. It just happened to be vile. Pardon? We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Just in general, though, you've got to be, you have to be careful with things like tea, right? Because tea is something which cooks very easily. Coffee, again, I'm not 100% sure with coffee what the process is. I imagine that the, the roasting of the coffee um, does something to it. But once it's ground down, then it obviously needs to be cooked in order to turn into something that can be drunk. Um, Again, adding, adding it to hot water, even when you want to make iced coffee, you have to put a little bit of hot water into it, right, to, uh, to make sure that it dissolves the way that it's supposed to, and then, uh, and then add all the bits and the pieces that you want in order to have iced coffee. So with, I, with coffee as well, you need to be careful. Now, again, for those of you who are scientists over here, this is going to be a little bit difficult to understand, but there is a concept inside of the halacha called klirishan, klisheni, which means a first vessel, a second vessel, and a third vessel. Now, according to the halacha, something hot water which is boiled up in the urn, right in the Shabbos kettle, is called a kli rishon. Right, that's your, that's the, 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 that's a vessel that it was cooked in. That's the vessel that is considered to be the primary vessel. That stuff is boiling hot water. That stuff cooks. It's a problem. If you transfer the hot water into your cup, the cup then becomes a cliché. Now, for most things, a cliché cannot cook halachically, even though you could put your finger in it 
and be sorry that you did because it's going to be very hot. Nevertheless, the hot water in a klisheni is not considered to be as potent as the hot water in a klisheni. Hold, hold on a second. Tea is a problem because even though a klisheni doesn't cook because tea is so sensitive, you've got to be careful with tea, which means that either you have to make sure that you put the water in before you add in the tea, or if you prefer, some people are very particular about their tea and whether, whether the tea is in there first and the water is added or the water is in there first and then the tea is added. If you come from England, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're not from England, then you'll probably think that that's all rather odd. And I have to tell you that I come from England and it is rather odd. Nevertheless, some people are very, they're purists about their tea. Uh, and if that's the case, if you want the tea to be in there first, you're going to have to put it into a klishlishi, which means that's a third cup and then add the hot water from the klisheni into the klishlishi, and then you can have your cup of tea. Mm. Yeah. I brought Patrick's cup for a second. I don't know, you have to I ask Patrick, mind. not me. So this is my first cup, right? Yes. And in here is my tea bag. I then take my hot water from the urn and put it inside there. Is that what you're saying? That's no good. No, you can do That's it. no good. What you have to do, if you're going to use a tea bag, which I don't recommend that you do, Okay. You have to put it into a klishlishi, which means that you're going to pour the hot water from the urn. It's going to go into your cup. It's going to go into a second cup. And then the tea bag is going to be added to it. What I recommend to everybody is not to use tea bags on Shabbos at all. Okay, right? fine, make, tea make tea essence. So let's say then, I don't know, like hot water with, with like tea essence lemon. Tea, lemon in it or something like hot, hot water with lemon juice. So if you, if you, if you, lemon juice or lemon? Le lemon. Piece of lemon. Yeah. If you're putting a piece of lemon, then you, all you need is a cliche and that's okay. Right? Again, what's the problem? In a clearition, if you put the piece of lemon into the urn itself, it's going to cook. Yeah. Right? Once you've moved it into the cup, the cup is no longer, again, it, it's cliche and you're allowed to put the lemon into it. Again, Raboy I understand absolutely the level of the heat inside of the cup is not going to be noticeably different to you but halachically it makes all the difference so here's my uh, here's my thing there's the urn and let's put one i've just put hot water into this glass i then move this glass this hot water into another cup transfer the hot water into another yes. cup, and then put the lemon into that cup that same no cup you can put the lemon into the cup after you put the hot water into so it so you can go straight from the urn hot water lemon in yes, yes. What you can't do, though, is you, if you're talking about tea, you can't do it with tea. Yeah. Uh, the, the vessel that you're talking about, does it matter what, what it's made out of? No, it doesn't make any difference at all, which means that you could put it into a glass cup, you can put it into a ceramic cup, you could even put it into a thermos, you could put it into a plastic cup for sure. Um, Thermos. I'm just trying to remember. I've got something rolling around in the back of my so mind. Each one of those takes heat away from <clears throat> a different rate. Say again, what? Each one of those takes the heat away from the water. Yeah, but as far as, far as the halacha is concerned, once you've it. moved it into there, it's lost its classification of being a clearition. So from the first vessel into a second vessel into a third vessel? From the original vessel into a second? Again, it depends, it depends what you want to make. Okay. So tea is three but if you if you want to make tea, then putting into a cliche is the best thing to do. Wow. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's just dehydrated yeah. coffee. Can't you just put it? In, it doesn't matter. Dehydrated coffee is what free is that freeze dried? Yeah. Yeah. I'm no, I'm not. I'm not looking at you. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what the halacha is. I have a feeling that freeze dried coffee is less problematic, which means that you can put it, you can put the water into, what you cannot do is you can't put the granules into the cup and pour the water into the cup. But you can put the water into the cup and then put the granules in afterwards. I like know so many people who do that though, and they, they like, they live their life around for a while. What, directly? You know what, I'll, lean later, I'll look into it, okay? Like I said, I'm, I'm not very, I'm not very, uh, Conversant, I don't, I don't drink this stuff. We, most Shabbos is in my house. Gosh, this is going from bad to worse. But most Shabbos <laughs> is in my house. We don't even have a hot water room. Okay, you know what? I think I've hit rock bottom. I've got no reaction except for you. Well, obviously, uh, I'm, I'm not able to judge me favorably, but everyone so else seems to. What about um, with hot Rabina, let's say then? 
Yeah. Give me an example of the hot ravina because I like drinking hot ravina. <coughs> so then here's my urn, and then I'm going to put one cup of water, right? Yes. Then I'm going to put ravina into my cup. Yes. Before I put the hot water in. No, so do it the other way around. Just, just put. You could take the water from the urn, put it into your cup, and then put the put the ravina into it. Mm -hmm. And then that... you don't need changes to it. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Yes, yeah, someone else would. Yes. I thought those like uh, cold brew uh, tea bags, like that's fine because nothing's really being cooked. It's just kind of like you have uh, to tell me what it is. I don't know. It's it's like a tea bag that you would put into you know cold water, but uh, it doesn't need to be hot for it to uh, to turn in to get oh, flavor really? out of it. You know. Okay. That's fine. Right? Can they be used in hot water? They can be, but uh, it, it's equally effective in cold. Have water. you have you got any idea whatsoever what's happened to this? To to. You know, before before you use it, what what has happened to the tea? It's tea leaves. It's tea yeah, granules. It's tea leaves, yeah, it's tea leaves in a bag. Okay, now I don't. I I mean, obviously, it's been through some kind of a process in order to get it to the point where you can add cold water and it will give yeah, its it taste, right? Yeah. But the question, the real question over here is what what has it been through? If, if it is it, what was the chat? It, if it if it's been through some kind of a, a steaming process, mm -hmm. then that makes it a lot less problematic because it's been cooked already, right? The question over here is what what has happened to it? I don't know. I'm not I'm not familiar with it at all actually. Mm -hmm. um, if you want bling later, I can try to try to find out. But uh, what what's it called? It's just called cold brew. That may just be like a brand name. Uh -huh. Okay, like whatever. I can try and find out what the. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of like Lipton cold brew. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah, you've heard of it. I'm and aware. it's it's a it looks there's it, no like cooking involved. It looks it's like just, a tea bag. It looks like a tea bag. It's a very large. It's much larger than usual. Uh huh. Um, but yeah. Okay. I don't know. It's official. <laughs> um. Well, you're asking, sorry, you're asking about what? You're asking about putting it into cold water or into hot water? Oh, cold water. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, you know what? We were, I, I, I was obsessing about hot water over here. Mm -hmm. And I just imagined that your question was revolving around hot water. Yeah, so uh, put it, using it for cold water is presumably not a problem. Presumably it is not a problem. What could be the problem? What are you doing? You're not cooking it, that's for sure not. Right? It's going into cold water and you're just making some kind of a cold tea what it sounds like, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's okay. Can you talk about salads or not? Because you're not officially allowed to cut up to prepare. Okay, let's talk about salads. Okay. Here, a <laughs> Uh like, like with everything else, preparing foods on Shabbos, you've got to be a little bit careful about what you're preparing and how you're preparing it. Yeah. Salad can be cut up, but it can't be cut up too small. Right, so over here they have something called an Israeli salad. What is an Israeli salad? Yeah. It's bits of cucumber and tomato that are chopped up, cut up to, you know, into small pieces. Uh, why is that called an Israeli salad? Because at one point that's all there was to eat over here, um, and that's why it's called an Israeli salad. Um, it's not very Israeli. Uh, it's just got some tomatoes and cucumbers in it. Uh, if you don't cut them up too small, there's no problem with preparing salad on Shabbos itself. Uh, everybody knows as well as I do that sometimes when you prepare salads before, the day before, so they go all soggy and they become a little bit unappetizing, um, which means that if you prefer to have your salad fresh, you can cut, most things can be cut up without a problem. What you have to be careful about not using is implements which are designed especially for salads. So for example, if you want to peel your cucumber, you shouldn't use a peeler, but rather you should use a knife instead and uh, strip off some of the some some of the cucumber will come away as well, not just the, not just the peel itself. Um, but the I, peeling goes for everything, or just the cucumber, like the apple. I don't want you know you can peel the apple too in a certain. Yeah, way. same 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 thing. You need to you need to be careful not to use um, not to use things that are used for peeling on Shabbos, right? So you can just just use a knife instead, right? Or if you want, you can. Uh, take a, an easier route, which is to stay away from all fruits and vegetables on Shabbos <laughs> and eat only things that have huge amounts of cholesterol blocking, you know, artery blocking, uh, cholesterol boosting uh, ingredients. Yeah. I heard, I read someplace, <clears throat> the, the utensil itself, if it's 
a natural extension of, of your hand, that it's permissible. But if it's an unnatural extension, like a peeler, you can't do that with your hands, um, would be not acceptable. So what 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 would be what what's um, that that if it's an extension, if it's a natural extension, like for a spoon, example, that's what, like you can't you can't um, you can't <clears throat> use the kind of a spoon with the holes in it to drain because uh -huh. you can't do that. But with a spoon, you, you, it is. But well, that's a problem of bora. That's a, a different problem altogether. I mean, the essence if you if you hold something in your hand like this, and you can drain out the liquid that that you're holding can go through your fingers. Right, but you, know, you can't strain. You you can't. Uh, what is it? No, strain? it's, it's a problem. It was a problem with boyer. That's a that's a different a different issue. Uh, according to what Patrick is saying, my boy, say you can peel your apple with a spoon. Uh huh. Yep. I wish you luck. But <laughs> <laughs> well, if you've got a grapefruit spoon, maybe you can do it. It's got little serrated edges, right? But, uh, <clears throat> um, but again, um, certain things you need to be careful about. You can't mush things up. Right, so for example, if you want if you want avocado salad, what's it called? Guacamole or whatever whatever you call that stuff. Yeah, guacamole. Guacamole. Say that again. Guacamole. Say it again. Guacamole. 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 I don't know you say. But... That's the correct word. Say it. Aguacate. Aw aguacate. Okay, if you want aguacate salad, uh, then uh, you're, you're not allowed. To, you're not allowed to mush it up. Right, you can you can mush it a little bit. But it's got to have identifiable lumps inside of it. Guacamole is normally, you know, like a paste, right? Very smooth. Uh, you shouldn't be doing that. Other things that you shouldn't be doing is that you shouldn't be mixing foods together. So, for example, you cannot make egg salad on Shabbos morning using mayonnaise. Now, you can, you can, have, you can have eggs that are mushed up and you can add mayonnaise to them. You can smear may mayonnaise on your, uh, on your challah and then add the eggs on top, but you can't mix them together. You can't turn them into a mixture. Right? Uh, same problem, for example, with tuna and mayonnaise as well. Mayonnaise is... It's a... What's tuna? What's, what's tuna? tuna? tuna. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. For those of you who are not from England, I meant to say tuna. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> take, take the avocado they, yeah can I peel it and, and cut mm -hmm. up in large pieces yeah yeah, okay, yeah. doubled eggs <clears throat> it's going to be a problem right that's what taking out the yolk and mixing it all together and mm -hmm. uh, and then putting it back in and making it look fancy yeah mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a problem uh, mm -hmm. they are right but you can prepare them beforehand and you can uh you know, and then, and then you can eat. There's no problem with eating any of these things before, you know, if they've been prepared before. So egg, egg salad you can prepare before and, and guacamole you can prepare, pre, pre, prepare before. And even, even tuna salad, right, can be prepared beforehand. And then there's no problem with eating them on Shabbos. The problem is mixing these things together on Shabbos. It becomes a, it becomes a, a, a problem whatever, something called dash, which is... Uh, you open up a can of tuna and put it in the fridge there and take it out for shoppers. Yeah, sure. You're not, you're not going to mix mayonnaise with it, just... Uh... Well, maybe yes. Maybe. No, no. So if you're going to mix mayonnaise, I suggest that you make it beforehand. Right? If you, if you don't mind having it together but not mixed together, so again, if you just want to smear some mayonnaise on your challah and put the tuna on top of it, then that's, that's no problem. That's fine. Okay. I have to tell you that it's interesting that, uh, you know, food, this seems to be the most interactive class we've ever had. <laughs> it's amazing, absolutely amazing. It really is, yes. You, uh, and it hasn't come to an end yet by the looks of it. Do you teach your dogs tricks on Charles? I, I don't have one. Work your dogs. I don't I, I don't have one, and I don't know any tricks. So, well, like car tricks, that kind of stuff. <laughs> have uh, your like dog do that, like right? the pee the trick with the three different, uh, yeah, the three yeah, different yeah. cups? Yeah, you teach a dog commands, or is that like working the dog? I don't. I, don't, I mean, the is I've, I, I don't think it's a problem. You got to be careful with pets. That there's a problem. <laughs> I wish you had novices. There's a problem on Shabbos. There's a problem called toilesh. When you when you pet your pet, which presumably is why they're called pets, uh, right? Uh, you might pull out their yeah. hair, uh, which means that on Shabbos you have to avoid. You need to avoid stroking your dog or your cat 
You can stroke your pet toad. <laughs> because <laughs> presumably, presumably <laughs> it's not hairy. I don't know. Can you make kiddish with a doggy? In room? No, you should, you should use wine. <laughs> okay, but even wine. Can you, make you can make kiddish with a dog in the room. Thing? Yeah. <laughs> or put on one of those adorable costumes on your dog, you know, like a little like, Eber schnitzel. Oh, and then you can pet it. Yeah. Absolutely. You know what I'm talking about? I love. Wiener Schnitzel. <laughs> Love it. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. What? what uh, <clears throat> I, I got uh, distracted there momentarily. The pulling the hair out of your pet, you can put some like, like a costume or a clothing or something. Right? Oh, yeah. Or you could just not you touch it. <laughs> I mean, what, what are you going to touch it for if it's wearing a costume? You mean like a Halloween thing? Rabbi, I have a question. <laughs> On the wine. There are some wines that have to uh, has a cork, and you gotta use something to open it. Yeah, you can do that on Shabbos. You can use you a cork take, opener to take the cork out of the. Uh, yeah, no, no problem at all. Interesting. Okay. No problem at all. No, there's no problem whatsoever with un uncorking a wine bottle on Shabbos. There is a problem with aluminium caps on Shabbos. What? Aluminium. Oh, I'm sorry. How do you say that? Say it again. Aluminum. 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 There is a problem with <laughs> aluminum <laughs> caps on Shabbos. Uh, you have to be sure to open them before Shabbos. The reason for that is because when they make the alumin aluminum caps, uh, it's not a machlokes. Rosh Hashanah Zalman plastic. Who me? Rosh Hashanah Zalman. I mean, chazit zok or something. Chazit opening it with Shabbos. Aluminum. Like it's a big kiddish. Yeah. 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 How, how do they make them? They, they, they have an enormous sheet that sits over a whole bunch of bottles when the bottles have been filled up. Indeed. And the machine comes down and presses the, alu, the, uh, yeah. the al aluminum. Alum aluminum. The, the aluminum onto the bottle, into the, into the shape. And it makes a little thing on the bottom that you can turn it, you know, that you're going to. Yeah. Open it up and it will crack open. The problem over there is something called asiat kli. Yeah. By opening up the bottle, by opening up the bottle top on Shabbos, you've that, that's what turns the bottle top into its own vessel, which is considered to be forbidden on Shabbos. Right. Um, one, of the, one of the greatest halachic authorities from the previous generation, Rosh Hashanah Zaman Oybach, ruled that it was, it was forbidden to open them on Shabbos. If you're stuck with a bottle that you want to get open, you have to put a hole in the top. If you puncture the top with a, with a knife or something or with a fork, before you open it, then you've destroyed the kli and that's okay. It's not a problem. Mm. Plastic bottle tops are a lot less problematic because they are created, they're, 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 they're pre-made before they're, they, they're forced onto the top of the bottle as it goes through the manufacturing process as a top already. It's already a cap as it goes on. As opposed to the sheet of al aluminum, aluminum, <laughs> the sheet of aluminum, I'm getting there, right? The sheet of aluminum, which before it's pushed onto the bottle top, doesn't have any function whatsoever, right? So that's something that you need to be careful about. Some people are careful to open up plastic bottle tops on, uh, on uh, before Shabbos as well, but that's something that you need to be a lot less concerned about. But you know, wine bottles, lots of wine bottles and come whiskey. with uh, huh? and whiskey. Whiskey normally comes with a cork, unless you're cheap, unless you're drinking cheap stuff, yeah, sorry, which I don't think you really want people here to know. I think can you use the uh, cork and bring it up? And... Over there, no, you don't need to because on whiskey bottles they've got it's got like a, a plastic piece on top oh, of the cork. Is, uh, no, but um, you can just pull it out. Okay. If you've got a regular bottle of wine with a regular cork inside of it, there's absolutely no problem whatsoever with taking a corkscrew. What about beers? Huh? Beers. Beers? Yeah. It's less problem because usually you never close the beer again. This is the reason to see. Efsha, right? You don't do I, don't, I've never, I don't think anyone has a problem with opening up beer on Shabbos, right? With a, with a uh, opening no, up... No, because it's a press of metal. Yeah. Like a can also, right? Yeah. Can, cans, interestingly enough, most, most authorities say that it's okay to open cans on really? Shabbos, yeah, huh? which I think is, a, is quite, a, quite a novel, uh, you, would, you would expect that to be something which is forbidden, mm -hmm. uh, but a, it's, it's okay to open a can on Shabbos, and uh, again, re regular, you know, it, it's okay to take a, any, a corkscrew, any kind of corkscrew, except for 
you know, I don't know if you've got uh, an, an electric corkscrew. I've got no idea that these things exist. Um, that can't be used on Shabbos, but there are all kinds of corkscrews nowadays. They have the old fashioned type. They've got ones that are, work on a vacuum. You just push the needle in and you press a button and it comes popping out. That's okay to use on Shabbos as well. You're not doing anything which is forbidden on Shabbos by, uh, by using that kind of a thing. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. The only thing you need to be concerned about perhaps is when you're opening the wine bottle on the top. Sometimes there are letters on the top. You've got to be careful not to tear the letters. So just make sure that you go around and that uh, you, cut, you cut around it like that. That's a problem. I'm really enjoying the leniency of alcohol on Shabbos. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. If, if your hot plate goes out on Shabbos, you can drown your sorrows <laughs> in oh plenty God. of alcohol. Weird. Pardon? Vitamins, vitamins. Vi vi vitamins. I don't know what vitamins are. I don't have a clue. But vitamins <laughs> are, uh, are something which the vast majority of the halakhic authorities say should not be taken on Shabbos uh, because they've got a din of being a little bit like medication. Medication shouldn't be taken unless there's an overwhelming need to do so. So if your doctor puts you on a on a on a, a regimen of taking vitamins that if you skip out a day it's going to mess everything up, then you would be permitted to take them. Otherwise you should skip out Shabbos, uh, you know, either take them later on on Friday afternoon and take them again on Monte Shabbos or something in order to get your dosage of whatever it is that you need to take. Good. Okay, we're going to stop over here. Mitzvah Shem. We we will uh, tomorrow. We're, I think we're going to take a look at Kabbalah Shabbos and try to work out what that's all about. Mm -hmm.